do males and females read their genomes differently? And I will uh, start with an image of my favorite pair of chromosomes. Um, <clears throat> to the left, stately, statuesque, <laughs> upright, uh, the grand X chromosome. And immediately uh, to its side, with its head down, the demure and diminutive Y chromosome. Now, to be honest, I have spent most of my career defending the honor, including with Stephen Colbert, defending the honor of the Y chromosome in the face of some insults to its character and its future prospects. Um, but I'm actually today going to try to spend as little time as possible actually discussing uh, either the X or the Y, and I will instead um, um, invite you to join me in my journey from an X and Y centric view of sex biology to one that looks across all of the human chromosomes. Because I'm gonna, when I say, do males and females read their genomes differently, I'm really gonna be making the argument today that males and females read all of their ordinary chromosomes, or what we call autosomes, that males and females read the autosomes differently. And um, as, was, uh, as John already indicated, I ascribe to the view of Dubjansky that nothing in biology, or I could say nothing in medicine, makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so I will frame things in an evolutionary context today. And um, uh, one thing that I'll just add to uh, John's introduction is that, so I've served as, as director at Whitehead for the last 14, 15 years, but I'm actually, it was just recently announced that actually Ruth Lehman from, um, uh, uh, from this island uh, at NYU uh, is going to succeed me as director at Whitehead next summer. And so I am increasingly being asked a question. Um, so in addition to this question of do males and females read their genomes differently, there's a personal question that I want to try to address with you today. And that's one that I'm asked by friends and colleagues with increasing frequency and urgency, which is, David, when you stop being director at Whitehead Institute, uh, what are you going to do with all your spare time? And so... Uh, what I want to do today is tell you about um, a, a goal that I have, um, which is <clears throat> to move the study of sex differences <clears throat> in health and disease and across the body, to move the study of sex differences uh, from the periphery of biomedical research, education, and therapy. And I'll argue that that's where it, that's where it has lived. Um, my goal is to move it to the center. And I'll see if today I can convince you um, to join me in, uh, uh, in, in, in working towards this goal. So first of all, um, you should be asking yourself, well, uh, what does he even mean by sex differences? Well, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty complex subject, but let's start with the uh, sort of introductory biology level of how do males and females become such. So I'm going to start with the initial uh, super binary view of, of, of how sex works, and that is in the first six weeks... Um, Let's see, I may ask some questions as we go along here just to make sure that we're all staying. So how long is a human gestation? Nine months, 40 weeks. So in the first six weeks of human development, there are no anatomic differences between XX and XY embryos. It's only in about the seventh week of the 40 where there start to appear light microscopically detectable differences between uh, a structure that's becoming the testis or what's becoming the ovary. The testis and the ovary come from the same uh, undifferentiated bipotential um, uh, structure. Okay, so this is the classic formulation of, of sex determination in mammals. And actually, I and many others a few decades ago were working hard on this question of how is it determined that the embryonic gonad becomes testis or ovary? 
But there are many other aspects of sex differences that are not nearly so binary. So <clears throat> I'll just pick out one example. Here is, um, this is a um, uh, sort of iconic photograph from the football field at the University of Connecticut. Um, this, was, uh, this photograph was taken in 1914. Here we have the students of the Connecticut State Agricultural College uh, arranged according to their heights from 4 feet 10 inches to 6 feet 2 inches. And this image is um, actually is often used by, uh, as a, among the first slides by people giving talks on quantitative genetics uh, because height is, is a favorite subject for thinking about the role of genes. But this is such an iconic image that the whole scene was recreated um, a few years later. So here is, it published in the journal Genetics in 1997, is a reenactment. But you notice a few things have changed. Uh, they're now, whereas before all the students were dressed in black, now there's a group of students in black and some dressed in white. And you'll see that the students dressed in black, their average height has shifted from 5 feet 7 to about 5 feet 10. And then they've been joined by the second group of students in white. And you see that the, the distributions of heights are substantially overlapping. They're more overlapping than not, yet there is about a five inch shift between the females uh, in white and the males in black. Now, okay, so why, did, how, why is it that the height of the males changed uh, on average from 5'7 to 5'10 across those years. Any, any speculations? Nutrition. Nutrition, that's a very good thought. But yeah, do any of you follow? Yes. Hormones in food. Okay, well, so that, that's, a very, that's a more specific version of the nutritional argument. But any of you, are there any sports fans here? Um, I mean, what does the University of Connecticut do routinely? both men and women. Well, they, they, they it's the only school, I think, in the country that where, both, uh, where they've won both the men and the women's championships in NCAA basketball. So another hypothesis is that, the, that the, maybe the admissions office had something to do with this. But in any case, but, um, but in any case, height is the most intensely studied trait in all of quantitative genetics. And you've got this interesting five-inch shift in the center of the distribution. So I'm going to come back to height um, in a few minutes. And then we could move on to other traits that are distinctly not binary, but that also show um, sex biases. So for instance, if we take lupus, for every male who's affected with lupus, there are six females. Or if we go. Um, uh, here to a subject that's, the, that's um, of interest to many uh, in this community, uh, autism spectrum disorder. For every girl who's diagnosed, there are, depending on who you ask, between three and five boys who are diagnosed with autism. And in these and many other disorders that show a strong sex bias, if we ask the question, what is responsible for that sex bias? The answer is a resounding, we have no idea. Um, and so in, in an effort to answer the question that I posed uh, uh, that, that pertains to my personal plans, um, I'm engaged in, a, in launching a scientific plan that begins with a new model of sex determination and differentiation. And I won't try to lay it, the model out in great detail today, but give you, begin to give you a flavor of where it's beginning. And I'll say this model is uh, much more fluid and dynamic, unlike accounts in today's textbooks and reviews. So as I showed you on that, that first slide, we have a very, in our textbooks, we have a very simple binary, fixed binary view of how sex determination works. But as soon as we get to height, or we get to lupus, or we get to autism, we realize we've got to soften that view. 
Um, it is a model that is not restricted to a few cell types. So traditionally, when we thought about sex determination and sex differentiation, we have confined, confined our thinking to the reproductive tract. That's the standard place to think about it. Uh, but I'm working towards a model that will not be restricted to a few cell types in the reproductive tract, but encompass all cell types throughout the body. And a model not restricted to sex chromosomes and I feel particularly empowered to say this because I've spent so many of the best years of my own life focused on the sex chromosomes, I now realize that we have to, we have to move far beyond the sex chromosomes and, uh, and look across the entire genome, recognizing that actually our autosomes, our ordinary chromosomes, carry 96% of our genes. And I will, I will uh, make this argument in uh, evolutionary sense too. So our plan and model are based on three key conjectures. So I'm going to lay out three key conjectures that um, underpin everything um, that uh, I will then go on to detail and what lies beyond. So those three key conjectures are first, that the autosomes are read differently in males and females. So again, we understand that the sex chromosomes are different in males and females. <coughs> two X's versus an X and a Y, typically. But I'm going to argue, again, that when we think about all of the ordinary pairs of chromosomes, and you have, anybody remember, how many chromosomes does a human cell have? 23. We have 23 pairs. 22 of those pairs are identical in males and females. So I'm going to focus my comments today really on those other 22 pairs. And I'm going to claim that this two readings of the genome, male and female readings, I'm going to claim that this has been true in our evolutionary lineage for 600 million years. And since before we, there even existed sex chromosomes in our lineage. And I'm going to claim that in mammals, the autosomes are read differently in every tissue, in every cell type at all developmental stages. And I will, assert, I will say, this is the model under which I'm operating. And, we, and, and of course, we don't have the proof of this as yet, but we have a whole lot of evidence that is consistent with and gives me, uh, 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 leads me to assert this. What does the word red mean in this sentence? OK. So Jim asked the question, what do I mean by, by red, by reading? So hang on to that, because I, I think it, I'm going to try to make that, what I mean by that, clear. Um, um, but it's a great question. So how then, if this is all going to be set in an evolutionary context, let's go back to the beginning of the evolution of sex. And so I will uh, start by asking, OK, how old is sex? Well, that's a, maybe a hard question. Um, let's. 130 million. Like from plants? From plants, OK. So let's go, let's hang on. To, that's a, that's a, uh, a, a nice proposal, 130 million. <laughs> let's say, let's, let's frame it even, even a little bigger. How old is the universe? 13, 14, 13, 14 billion. I know there's been some debate about this in uh, just the past year. Um, OK, so how old is the planet? Four, four and a half billion, something like that. I heard somebody say 600,000, uh, 6,000 years or something. No, no, it's four, <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so, so if the planet is four, four and a half billion years old, how old is sex? I'm going to suggest that in the evolution of sexual reproduction, there were four great inventions. The first of them is coming up with some means of exchanging hereditary information, and I will credit prokaryotes with having developed this on the order of three to four billion years ago, most of the age of the planet. Um, but it turns out that in prokaryotes, you know, bacteria and such, um, the exchange of hereditary information was a fairly free form, uninhibited activity. All of that changed with the coming of the nucleus and the arrival of eukaryotes who put genes in pairs. Now, 
I was just actually lecturing to some <coughs> Boston area high school biology teachers a week ago today, and I asked them, do you teach that, that eukaryotes, nucleated organisms, all reproduce by meiosis? And they said, no, we don't teach that. But I'm going to, uh, so they now know that. I'm now sharing this with you. So why do we put genes, why are genes in pairs? Why do we have 23 pairs? Why are, do genes come in pairs? Well, so somebody said, I think it's basically, if they didn't come in pairs, there would be massive unemployment among geneticists. <laughs> um, I mean, just. Uh, you could not teach Mendelian genetics if, if genes, no, but you, genes come in pairs, so you can take the pairs apart at meiosis and put them back together again at fertilization. That's what it's all about. It isn't just, you know, it, you don't have 23 pairs just for the fun of it. It's, it, it is, well, maybe it is for the fun. You, so you, you, you take the pairs apart at meiosis and you put them back together. And so that means there's an alternation of diploid and haploid phases in a life cycle. And I will offer up here as a species that took uh, sex to this level, sexual reproduction to this level, I will offer up here yeast, bakers, brewers yeast. and. Um, uh, and it turns out that meiosis, this defining feature of sexual reproduction as it, as it occurs in eukaryotes, it looks like this evolved or was invented once on the order of one and a half to two billion years ago. This is an incredible juncture in, uh, in our evolution. But it turns out in yeast, there are two kinds of, yeast makes two kinds of gametes, or they're called spores, they are called A and alpha, and you can't tell them apart. They're structurally indistinguishable. So the next invention that gets piled on top is dimorphic gametes. So making a big one and a little one. The big one we'll call an egg, and whoever makes the big one we'll call a female, and whoever makes the little one we'll call a male. This is the most generally applicable definition of male and female across the animal kingdom. Do you make the big gamete or the little gamete? And it turns out that this was invented several times in animals. And in our own lineage, it was invented on the order of 600 to 700 million years ago. And I'm gonna offer up as a species that takes sex to this level, I'm gonna offer up the turtle. Now, um, I know this is a little explicit. I apologize for, uh, um, but uh, so why the turtle? Well, here I show you the internal, these line drawings are the internal reproductive anatomies of uh, male and female turtle. They're every bit as different as are the internal anatomies of a mammalian male and female. But I show the turtle here because it turns out, um, anybody here know how sex is determined in turtles? Temperature. It turns out that turtles have no sex chromosomes. They exist as males and females. So male and female are genetically identical in turtles, which is to say, um, and so it's good, it's good, it was said here that Sex is determined by temperature. The temperature at which the egg incubates determines which anatomy you get. But what that means is the existence of two sexes in turtles is purely epigenetic. So sometimes, I think we're used to thinking about epigenetics as a way of sort of tweaking things a little bit. Well, you get two different sexes, two different anatomies out of the same genome by reading it differently. So, Jim, to get to your question, I would say this is, one pe this is one version of what I mean when I say that males and females read the same genome differently. I would say in turtles, uh, without any question, there can be a male and a female reading of the same genome and you get two different anatomies out. So, um, and I'm gonna suggest that what turtles know, we have not forgotten two readings of the genome. But we've gone on to add 
a fourth invention, which is sex chromosomes. Okay. So, and this can be in the form of XXXY. Ah, so I'm going to give you a piece of information that will be really useful at the next cocktail party you go to. Um, so you can explain, uh, you can say, hey, did you know that butterflies are ZZZW? And basically, if it is the male that has two different sex chromosomes, the naming convention is you call them X and Y. If it is the female that has two different sex chromosomes, the naming convention is that you call them Z and W. Any Canadians here? Do we have any? Yes, okay, Z and W. All right, so. Um, um, so, and it turns out that sex chromosomes have, e have evolved uh, uh, from ordinary chromosomes independently many, many times across the animal kingdom and across the plant kingdom. And in our own lineage, mammals, our sex chromosomes began to evolve from ordinary chromosomes, ordinary autosomes, on the order of 200 to 300 million years ago. But again, I'm making the point that these inventions, sex chromosomes gets piled on top of dimorphic gametes, gets piled on top of meiosis. And for anybody who's keeping, keeping uh, score, I'll just point out that this is completely the opposite of the way it is taught in every biology course and in every medical school. Where, guess, where, what does the chapter on sex determination in every genetics course and every developmental biology course start with, it starts with the sex chromosomes. And then you work down from there. And what I'm saying is that that actually makes no sense evolutionarily. It, it, it places too much emphasis, actually, on the sex chromosomes. Um, <clears throat> so where, then, did our sex chromosomes come from? Well, so we parted. Our ancestors parted company with the ancestors of birds about 300 million years ago. And this poses a real problem, because we ended up as mammals with an XXXY system, with the males having two different sex chromosomes, and the birds ended up with the females having two different sex chromosomes. So what was the, you know, how did this come to be? So we might say there's a male-specific Y that is, in some sense, reciprocal of a female-specific W. The W is a female-specific chromosome in birds. And then there's a sex-shared sex chromosome in both of these groups. So over the last 20, 25 years, um, uh, a group of a, a series of students in my lab have had great fun showing how this all makes sense. And that is, they found that the human X and Y evolved from ordinary autosomes. And one of the best pieces of evidence that they evolved from ordinary autosomes of our shared ancestor with birds is that those autosomes that became our X and Y live on today as autosomes in birds. So the next time you go to a chicken farm and you will have some uh, miniaturized DNA sequencing device in your hand, and you sequence that the first chicken you encounter, um, and then you'll take out your smartphone and do the alignment with your own genome, and you will find that uh, chromos chicken chromosome four is a dead ringer for the short arm of your X chromosome, and that chicken chromosome uh, ch sorry chicken chromosome one is a dead ringer for your short arm, chicken chromosome four is a dead ringer for the long arm of your X chromosome. Now, it's, some change has happened over 300 million years, but it's no trouble aligning the, uh, aligning the texts. Um, so where then did the bird sex chromosomes, those Z and W, where did they come from? It turns out the Z and W in birds evolved from other ordinary autosomes of our common ancestor, and guess what? They remain autosomes in us today. So in particular, your chromosome 9, um, if it had ended up in a bird, it would be, um, it would be a Z and a W. Okay. So 
And I, every time I, I, sh I get a chance to explain this, I have to stop and pause because for me, this is a thing of enormous beauty. <laughs> so these reciprocal experiments of nature that have actually played out in parallel, independently, but in parallel over the last uh, few hundred million years. <clears throat> so, but the point is that putting this in the context of putting the sex chromosomes in their place, the existence of females and males, as seen in the turtle, seen at dimorphic gamete, the existence of females and males predates sex chromosomes. There were two sexes before there were sex chromosomes. Um, and so I now want to diverge into um, uh, a very brief um, art history lesson. So we'll... Um, so, okay, so here is, um, um, so we're, as we go into art history class here, I will just ask members of the class, uh, so what do you see in this image? You see Noah's Ark. Okay, there's Noah's Ark. That's, that's, that's a piece of the background. But what's, what's the theme of the image? Pairs, pairs, right? Two of each, right? So I think that the artist here um, perhaps did not realize that in depicting this, um, so, so I would say this is a, a, a sort of artistic pain to the idea of two readings of the genome um, and the idea of how ancient um, in um, the animal kingdom the notion of two readings is. And I suspect that this artist in painting this didn't realize that it could be used as the basis for talking about temperature dependent sex determination. Uh, that's true in the crocodiles and the alligators. It's true in the turtles and tortoises down here. Um, or the artist could have been intending that we would talk about ZZZW systems as found in these snakes on the roof of the ark or in the butterflies that also, uh, or maybe in the peacocks over there. Uh, and then of course we could point out some mammals that have XXXY sex chromosomes. So the point, what I'm really driving home is that this, it doesn't matter how you choose between the two readings, how sex is determined, whether it's temperature, whether it's XY, whether it's ZW, actually the ancient truth is the existence of the two readings. <laughs> That's a much older um, biological reality. So how then, um, having set up this up, how then does gene expression differ in females and males? And this is sort of the second, Jim, this is sort of the second answer to your question. So I, I put forward the turtle as uh, a living anatomic example of two readings of a genome. Now I want to go down to the level of the genes and their expression and talk about what I'll call sex-biased gene expression. So how does gene expression differ between males and females? And here I'm going to talk about the work of Sahin Nakfi, who was a terrific graduate student, uh, just started his postdoc at Stanford, and he was joined by these colleagues, Alex, Jen, Mary, uh, at Whitehead, and a key collaborator, Rick Mitchell, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Sahin and his colleagues asked a number of questions that I'm going to walk you through. So how does gene expression differ in organs outside the reproductive tract, in organs that are that we would think of as being the same in males and females. And are sex biases in gene expression conserved between humans and other mammals that are used in basic research and pharmaceutical research? Or is, it all, is everything changing so rapidly that we don't find any conservation? And do sex biases in gene expression across the genome, do sex biases in gene expression of the autosomes do they contribute to sex differences in a trait? So I'm going to take you, um, now we're going to go deep into Sahin's study. And, and I'll say that he um, surveyed sex differences in gene expression across uh, four. So he took humans. We're going to come back to humans. But I'm going to focus first on um, four non-human mammals, uh, a monkey, 
a mouse, rat, and dog. And he focused on 12 tissues that are highlighted. They're sort of, um, their outlines are highlighted on these um, cartoons. Um, and basically took some steps to ensure um, the equanimity and um, quality of the comparisons. The only thing that's really key is to remember these four species, 12 organs. And then uh, he brought humans into, into play by uh, reanalyzing a, a, a public consortium um, effort to look in detail at uh, tissues from um, human males and females and clean these samples up with um, the assistance of pathologists to make sure that uh, uh, samples that, were, that obviously had disease uh, were called out. Again, looking at those 12 target tissues and, uh, and then conducted RNA sequencing, deep RNA sequencing of, um, well, that had been done by others in the case of the GTEx human data, but across the other four non-human species. And here is, um, <clears throat> here is a, um, a kind of uh, dendrogram, kind of free association, allowing each of, these, each of these RNA sequencing libraries from 72 human RNA sequencing libraries and 277 non-human uh, RNA sequencing libraries. Essentially, what Sahin's doing in this analysis is just asking of each of these RNA sequencing explorations of the tissue, find your find your nearest neighbors, find your closest friends, allow these libraries to all free associate and, um, and form this tree. And that's what's shown over here. What I'll boil this down to is to point out that the samples cluster first by tissue. In other words, the lung knows its lung, no matter whether it's coming from a male or female, or, or which of these species it's coming from. So lung knows its lung, liver knows its liver. Second, this, the tissues, second, the libraries cluster by species. And third, they cluster by sex, most of the time. Which is to say that sex is a subtle variable. It is a subtle third order variable in uh, as a determinant of each tissue's RNA composition, its so-called transcriptome. So we know we're studying something subtle, but we know that in the end, we will end up with very strong biases between the sexes in the incidences of disease like lupus, autism, and so on. So his search for subtle sex bias in expression, um, then went on to focus on, um, he went on to focus on, on each of 12,000 genes. 12,000 genes where, you could, where he could unambiguously say, I'm studying this particular gene in each of these five species, where he can match them up unambiguously across the five species, and assayed in each of 12 tissues. So we're gonna put sort of a, a matrix together here, 12 tissues, 12,000 genes times five species. And um, so the 12,000 genes, 12 tissues, it's 144,000 gene tissue pairs. And it turns out that each genes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you to join me in thinking about in each of these samples, in each of these tissues, each gene can be thought of as a sex meter. Uh, by that I mean that each gene's expression in each tissue and each species can be sex neutral. That is, the gene is expressed at the same level in males or females, or it could be male bias that is more highly expressed in males or more highly expressed in females. And everything else I'm going to tell you from here to the end requires um, is based on this simple sort of uh, designation of polarity, either neutral, male biased, or female biased. Um, and I, first, I'm going to summarize um, what, what Sahin found in terms of uh, sex bias across the genome in these tissues and these species. So first, 
um, of the um, of the 144,000 gene tissue pairs that he assayed, Sahin found that 40% of these gene tissue pairs, 40% of these showed sex-biased expression in one or more species. Okay, so a big fraction of all the genes are, are, are sex-biased in one or more species. Of the 12,000 genes assayed, 85% of them showed sex-biased expression in at least one tissue in one or more species. And among sex-biased gene tissue pairs, 7% are conserved. That is, there's a sex bias in the same direction among at least four of the five species. So this is a, this is a new kind of conservation, conservation of sex bias uh, for a gene in a particular tissue. So, and it turns out that in every tissue, Sahin, uh, and these are all outside the reproductive tract, Sahin finds hundreds of genes that display conserved sex-biased expression. And I will make the point that the great, great majority of these genes are located on the autosomes that are absolutely the same between males and females. And this is, this is a large part of what I mean when I say that males and females read the genome differently. Um, <clears throat> so, do these sex biases in gene expression across the genome, do they make a difference? Does it matter? Do they contribute to a trait? Well, so I'm going to tell you about a first test case that Sahin uh, carried out. And that goes back to one of those slides I showed you from the University of Connecticut football field. So Sahin compared his data on sex bias gene expression with published genomic studies of height. Now again, I'm going to make the argument, so height is um, the most intensely studied trait in all of quantitative genetics. It's the most intensely studied trait in all of human genetics. And you could ask, you could think about all the reasons why that might be the case. But I'm going to give you the bottom line. Sahin found that conserved sex bias in gene expression explains part of the five inch or 13 centimeter difference in mean height of human females and males. So why did Sahin think about even looking at this? Well, it turns out that in most mammalian species, not all, but in most mammalian species, males tend to be a little larger or a little taller, like five to 10% um, than females. So it's a reasonably conserved sex differential trait. Again, overlapping distributions, but there tends to be a five to 10% difference. And among the genes with conserved female bias um, in expression, what actually a particular gene um, jumped out in Sahin's analysis and got him thinking also about height as a factor. So it turns out there's a transcription factor that has been implicated in height and size across mammals. And that is, some, that is a gene called L-C-O-R-L, L-coral. It's expressed in the pituitary gland, and it has been shown, it has been implicated um, in height and body size in humans, in cattle, and in horses. So it's in very distinguished company, uh, <laughs> publication-wise. Right, um, not very many genes could um, could this be set off, um, and it turns out that in both humans and horses, a fancier version of genetic analysis has been done that has revealed that if L coral's expression is taken up, in other words, if you turn up the volume on L coral, you become smaller or shorter. Okay, so. It turns out that people vary in the level of expression of l coral, and the more l coral expression you have, you, the shorter you tend to be. Okay. So, and, and it turned out that what, what had not been previously recognized was that l coral's expression is actually sex-biased 
in, it had not been noticed in any of these species. But what you see here is that Sahin finds that the, um, the female samples, the orange dots, show slightly higher expression on average than the blue dots, the male samples. And this is true in uh, human, monkey, mouse, rat, and dog. But it's subtle. It's not an on-off switch. This is not a sex-specific gene. Um, and so Sahin said, oh, this is interesting. So think, I want you to let this example sink in a little bit. So this is a gene that tends to be a little bit more highly expressed in the female than the male, and higher expression, and actually in, in either males or females, tends to make you a little shorter. So Sahin thought, oh, maybe I'll look for other examples like Elko. And basically what he found, and I, so I really want to emphasize the point here that l coral, to all appearances, l coral is working in humans, cattle, and horses, in both sexes, in the same way. There's nothing sex-specific about it at all. It's just that Sahin is finding that the dial, the volume dial, is set a little bit differently in males and females. So are there other examples like this? So Sahin went looking, and uh, so now we got to go back to height as a, and really think a little bit more deeply about this. So it turns out the distribution of heights in human females, this is a fancier version of the football field at the University of Connecticut with lots more data, and a beautiful normal distribution of heights in females, nor a beautiful normal distribution of heights in males, in fact, some methods and statistics were developed so as to describe height. Um, and there's that 13 centimeter shift. Uh, and this is the most intensely studied trait in all of quantitative genetics. It's, it's worse than that. It's, this is the trait, this is sort of the test track for taking out new methods in human genetics. In other words, you know, you need a racing circuit if you're developing automobiles. Well, height is the racing circuit for trying out new methods. Um, and it turns out that the genetic architecture of height uh, is really shared between human females and males, which is to say there are, at this, at this point in time, more than 700 genes have been implicated as minor contributors to variation in height among males. So imagine 700 genes, each making infinitesimally small but collectively substantial contributions to height um, among females. Another 700 genes um, implicated in height in males, and it turns out it's the same 700 genes. So despite enormous investments in studying this trait, the 13 centimeter shift had never been explained. So there was nothing sex, you could imagine that you could have found different genes that contributed to height variation in males and females, but that was not the case. And so what Sahin did then was to take the l coral example and see if he could generalize it. And so, oh, and I should say that, <coughs> um, you know, uh, Sahin and our lab did none of these studies of height. This was all the work of others that was made publicly available, and so we simply stole it from, um, you know, public repositories. Uh, that's why it's put in there, so you can do that easily. Um, and, but lovely studies of the variation in height by other teams of investigators had divided the height-influencing genes into two groups, genes whose increased expression makes a person shorter. l coral was an example. There were other sets of genes that had been identified as increased expression tends to make you taller. And so what Sahin saw was an opportunity to compare these genomic studies of height with his data on conserved sex bias in, in gene expression. So we're basically going to marry, what Sahin's going to do now is marry his data on sex bias gene expression, which is without any reference to height, 
going to marry it to uh, studies of uh, the same sets of genes by students of height. <clears throat> and basically, something really uh, striking fell out of this analysis, and that is he found a correlation between conserved sex bias and a gene's expression. Uh, um, uh, sorry, he saw a correlation between a conserved sex bias in the gene's expression and the effect that others have, have observed of that same gene on height. So let's start here. Here are two, uh, I'm showing female bias genes, right? So the upper meter, that meter, uh, in both cases, I'm showing you genes that are female biased in their expression. Those could be, in some cases, those could be genes whose increased expression tends to make you shorter or whose increased expression tends to make you taller, and you might expect this to work out kind of randomly. But what Sahin observed was that, in fact, the set of genes with conserved female bias is enriched for genes that tend to make you shorter. This was surprising. And then, on the other side, let's think about the genes that are male biased. What's, and you know, you, these could include genes that tend to make you shorter or that others would observe to, to tend to make you taller. And what Sahin observed was the genes that are male biased in their expression tend to, um, uh, are, they are enriched for genes that tend to make you taller. I think my, losing my, Can you hear me okay? That's okay? Okay. I've uh, got my headdress off there for a minute. Um, <clears throat> so in any case, this was um, for Sahin and for us a, a stunningly um, unpredicted but interesting result. And so the, when you put it all together, what you find is that like l coral, other genes with conserved female bias and expression tend to decrease height. And genes with conserved male bias and expression tend to increase height. Uh, and summed across hundreds of implicated genes, these two effects tend to decrease mean height in females and increase mean height in males, uh, explaining, again, 12% of the observed difference in mean heights of, uh, in, in females and males. And I want to make the point that Sahin's study was not designed to explain sex differences in height at all. Uh, and in fact, he's looking at sex bias in gene expression in adult tissues, which should be of no relevance whatsoever to height. Uh, but evidently, there is a remaining signal uh, from earlier sex biases of those genes that can still be detected. And so I suspect that even though um, you know, this is explaining only 12%, if we were looking at the relevant developmental stages and perhaps at more tissues and more cell types, we think that more of this could be explained. Um, <clears throat> so to sum up, what I've, um, what I've uh, said is that in every tissue tested, Sahin finds hundreds of genes with sex-biased expression, and that sex that is conserved among diverse mammals uh, conserved sex biases and gene expression across the genome can explain today 12% of the difference in mean height of human females and males. Uh, these conserved sex biases, these are conserved sex biases in expression of genes that are otherwise operating identically in males and females. There is nothing sex specific about any of this. It's just setting the volume dials a bit differently. Um, and next steps are many. So among the, the next steps are to go deeper, to look at more tissues, to look not just at bulk tissues, but to look at individual cells and individual cell types that make up those tissues, and to look at developmental stages, to get a richer picture of what we mean by sex-biased expression. And then there are questions that lie downstream of sex bias gene expression, not just height, but do sex biases in gene expression conserved or perhaps acquired more recently in evolution, 
Can those explain sex differences in disease risk? And looking upstream of sex bias gene expression, so where does sex bias gene expression come from? How can we understand its origins? Is it a matter of sex hormones, which we know are regulators of gene expression? Is sex bias in gene expression a consequence of sex hormones? Is it in some way more directly cued up by the sex chromosomes, or is it a complex mix? And you might say, well, surely we must know that already. The answer is, we don't have a clue. The question has not, this question has not been framed or addressed. And ultimately, I would say our goals are um, in, uh, after this is all fleshed out and taken to, its, uh, taken to its limits, our goals of this Sex Differences Initiative are to change the way medicine is taught, the way it's practiced, the way research is conducted, the way drugs are developed and tested, and hopefully transform some healthcare outcomes. So, with that, I will stop, and I'd be delighted to take your questions. Looks like we've got some time for it. Thank you.